Roughing It by Mark Twain. We were to leave town quietly after midnight in two or three small parties so as not to attract attention and meet at dawn on the divide overlooking Mono Lake, eight or nine miles distant. We were to make no noise after starting and not speak above a whisper under any circumstances. It was believed that for once white man's presence was unknown in the town and his expedition unsuspected. Our conclave broke up at nine o'clock and we set about our pre preparations diligently and with profound secrecy. At eleven o'clock we saddled our horses, pitched them with their long riotas or lassos and then brought out a side of bacon, a sack of beans, a small sack of coffee, some sugar, a hundred pounds of flour in sacks, some tin cups and a coffee pot, frying pan and some few other necessary articles. All these things were packed on the back of a lead horse, of a lead horse, and whoever has not been taught by a Spanish adept to pack an animal let him never hope to do the thing by natural smartness. That is impossible. Higby had had some experience, but was not perfect. He put on the pack saddle, a thing like a sawbuck, piled the property on it, and then wound a rope all over and about it and under it, every which way, taking a hitch in it every now and then, and occasionally surging back on it till the horse's side sunk in and he gasped for breath. But every time the lashings grew tight in one place, they loosened in another. We never did get the load tight all over, but we got it so that it would go so that it would do after a fashion. And then we started, in single file, close order, and without a word. It was a dark night. We kept the middle of the road and proceeded in a slow walk past the rows of cabins. And whenever a miner came to his door, I trembled for fear the light would shine on us and excite curiosity, but nothing happened. We began the long winding ascent of the canyon toward the divide, and presently the cabins began to grow infrequent and the intervals between them wider and wider, and then I began to breathe tolerably freely and feel less like a thief and a murderer. I was in the rear leading the pack horse. As the ascent grew steeper, he grew proportionately less satisfied with his cargo and began to pull back on his riata occasionally and delay progress. My comrades were passing out of sight in the gloom. I was getting anxious. I coaxed and bullied the pack horse till I presently got him into a trot. And then the tin cups and pans strung about his person frightened him and he ran. His riata was, round, was wound around the pommel of my saddle, and so as he went by, he dragged me from my horse, and the two animals traveled briskly on without me. But I was not alone. The loosened cargo tumbled overboard from the pack horse and fell close to me. It was abreast of almost the last cabin. A miner came out and said, Hello! I was thirty steps from him and knew he could not see me. It was so very dark in the shadow of the mountain. So I lay still. Another head appeared in the light of the cabin door, and presently the two men walked toward me. They stopped within ten steps of me, and one said, Listen, I could not have been in a more distressed state if I had been escaping justice with a price on my head. Then the miners appeared to sit down on a boulder, but I could not, though I could not see them distinctly enough to be very sure what they did. One said, I heard a noise as plain as I ever heard anything. It seemed to be about there. A stone whizzed by my head. I flattened myself out in the dust like a postage stamp and thought to myself, if he mended his aim ever so little, he would probably hear another noise. In my heart now, I execrated secret expectations. I promised myself that this should be my last. Though the Sierras were ribbed with cement veins, then one of the men said, I'll tell you what, 
Welch knew what he was talking about when he said he saw a white man today. I heard horses. That was the noise. I'm going down to Welch's right away. They left and I was glad. I did not care whether they went, so they went. I did not care whither they went, so they went. I was willing they should visit Welch, and the sooner the better. As soon as they closed their cabin door, my comrades emerged from the gloom. They had caught the horses and were waiting for a clear coast again. We remounted the cargo on the pack horse and got underway, and as day broke, we reached the divide and joined Van Dorn. Then we journeyed down into the valley of the lake, and feeling secure, we halted to cook breakfast, for we were tired and sleepy and hungry. Three hours later, the rest of the population filed over the divide in a long procession and drifted off out of sight around the borders of the lake. Whether or not my accident had produced this result, we never knew, but at least one thing was certain. The secret was out, and white man would not enter upon a search for the cement mine this time. We were filled with chagrin. We held a council and decided to make the best of our misfortune and enjoy a week's holiday on the borders of the curious lake. Mono, it is sometimes called, and sometimes the Dead Sea of California. It is one of the strangest freaks of nature to be found in any land, but it is hardly ever mentioned in print and very seldom visited, because it lies away off the usual routes of travel, and besides, it is so difficult to get that, that only men content to endure the roughest life will consent to take upon themselves the discomforts of such a trip. On the morning of our second day, we traveled around to a remote and particularly wild spot on the borders of the lake, where a stream of fresh, ice-cold water entered it from the mountainside, and then we went regularly into camp. We hired a large boat and two shotguns from a lonely ranchman who lived some ten miles further on, and made ready for comfort and recreation. We soon got thoroughly acquainted with the lake and all its peculiarities. Chapter 38 Mono Lake Shampooing made easy Thoughtless act of our dog and the results Lie water Curiosities of the lake Free hotel Some funny incidents a little overdrawn Mono Lake lies in a lifeless, treeless, hideous desert 8,000 feet above the level of the sea, and is guarded by mountains 2,000 feet higher, whose summits are always clothed in clouds. This solemn, silent, sailless sea, this lonely tenant of the loneliest spot on earth, is little graced with the picturesque. It is an unpretending expanse of grayish water, about 100 miles in circumference, with two islands in its center, mere upheavals of rent and scorched and blistered lava, snowed over with gray banks and drifts of humus stone and ashes, the winding sheet of the dead volcano, whose vast crater the lake has seized upon and occupied. The lake is 200 feet deep, and its sluggish waters are so strong with alkali that if you could only dip the most hopelessly soiled garment in, into them once or twice and wring it out, it will be found as clean as if it had been through the ablest of washerwomen's hands. While we camped there, our laundry work was easy. We tied the week's washing astern of our boat and sailed a quarter of a mile, and the job was complete, all to the wringing out. If we threw the water on our heads and gave them a rub or so, a white lather would pile up three inches high. This water is not good for bruised places and abrasions of the skin. We had a valuable dog. He had raw places on him. He had more raw places on him than sound ones. He was the rawest dog I almost ever saw. He jumped overboard one day to get away from the flies, but it was bad judgment. In his condition, it would have been just as comfortable to jump into a, the fire. The alkali water nipped him in all the raw places simultaneously, and he struck out for the shore with considerable interest. He yelped and barked and howled as he went. And by the time he got to the shore, there was no bark to him, for
where he had barked the bark all out of his inside and the alkali water had cleaned the bark all off his outside, and he probably wished he had never embarked in any such enterprise. He ran round and round in a circle and pawed the earth and clawed the air and threw double, double somersaults, sometimes backward and sometimes forward in the most extraordinary manner. He was not a dem demonstrative dog as a general thing, but rather of a grave and serious turn of mind, and I never saw him take so much interest in anything before. He finally struck out over the mountains at a gait which we estimated about, at about 250 miles an hour, and he is going yet. That was about nine years ago. We look for what is left of him along here every day. A white man cannot drink the water of Mono Lake, for it is nearly pure lye. It is said that the Indians in the vicinity drink it sometimes, though. It is not improbable, for they are among the purest liars I ever saw. There will be no additional charge for this joke, except to parties requiring an explanation of it. This joke has received high commendation from some of the ablest minds of the age. There are no fish in Mono Lake, no frogs, no snakes, no polywigs, nothing in fact that goes to make life desirable. Millions of wild ducks and seagulls swim about the surface, but no living thing exists under the surface except a white feathery sort of worm, one half an inch long, which looks like a bit of white thread frayed out at the sides. If you dip up a gallon of water, you will get about 15,000 of these. They give to the water a sort of grayish white appearance. Then there is a fly which looks something like our, our horse, our, then there is a fly which looks something like our house fly. These settle on the beach to eat the worms that wash ashore. At any time, you can see there are a belt of flies an inch deep and six feet wide, and this belt extends clear around the lake, a belt of flies 100 miles long. If you throw a stone among them, they swarm up so thick that they look dense, like a cloud. You can hold them under water as long as you please. They do not mind it. They are only proud of it. When you let them go, they pop up to the surface as dry as a patent office report and walk off as unconcernedly as if they had been educated especially with a view to affording instructive entertainment to man in that particular way. Providence leaves nothing to go by chance. All things have their uses and their part and proper place in nature's economy. The ducks eat the flies and the flies eat the worms. The Indians eat all three. The wild cats eat the Indians. The white folks eat the wild cats. And thus, all things are lovely. Mono Lake is a hundred miles in a straight line from the ocean.